Colossians chapter number 4. And tonight we're going to be asking the question, are you willing? Are you willing? And it's interesting to me as we get to the end of these letters to look at the different individuals that the Apostle Paul names and how he chooses to describe them and what he chooses to say to them, you know. Uh, every single one of us have different people around our lives that, that support us, that help us, that fulfill different things. I know as a pastor there's a number of people out there uh, who are giving, who are praying, who are serving in a lot of different areas and different capacities, not just here, but really all around the world to be a help and a support to me and my wife and my family so that we can do what it is that God has called us to do. And the Apostle Paul had some men and some women like that as well. And at the end of these letters, he often describes and talks about them, tells a little bit about what they mean to them, what they do, and what they accomplish. And as we look at these different names tonight, you know, I, I'm always challenged to wonder what would be said or be written about me. And I want you to think about that here tonight. What would be said, what would be written about you? As he talks about these different individuals, I want you to, to think about, are you willing to do what they were willing to do? Or if they weren't willing, are you willing to do what they weren't willing to do? And so for the most part, we're going to look at some positive aspects. We'll look at one negative here. As well. Colossians chapter number 4, beginning in verse number 7, says, All my state shall Tychicus declare unto you, who is a beloved brother and a faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord, whom I have sent unto you for the same purpose that he might know your estate and comfort your hearts with Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother who is one of you. They shall make known unto you all things which are done here. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, saluted you. And Marcus, sister's son to Barnabas, touching whom ye re receive commandments, if he come unto you, receive him. Uh, verse number 11, And Jesus, which is called Justice, who are of the circumcision, these only are my fellow workers unto the kingdom of God, which have been a comfort unto me. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. For I bear him record that he hath a great zeal for you and them that are in Laodicea and them in Hyopolis. Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. Salute the brethren which are in Laodicea and Nymphus and the church which is in his house. And when this epistle is read among you, cause that it be read also in the church of the Laodiceans and that ye likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. And say to Archippus, take heed to the ministry which thou hast received in the Lord that thou fulfill it. The salutation by the hand of me, Paul. Remember my bonds. Grace be with you. Amen. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word tonight. And Lord, we really do have a lot to be thankful for. We look at our lives and all the different ways that you bless us each day. Every hour and moment we have so many things that we could just stop and, and thank you for. And, and Lord, please forgive us because a lot of times we take what you do for us for granted. And we, don't, we aren't thankful. And uh, Lord, as we stop and think tonight about the different people that you place into our lives, you know, I know personally there are a number of people that you have placed into my life to be a help and a blessing and a comfort and encouragement, Lord, uh, uh, provoking to correction at times, willing to speak the truth and to be able to do what you've called me to do. And Lord, uh, each of us have that. We thank you for those people. We pray that you would bless them for the work that they do, for the cause of Christ in a lot of different ways and areas. But Lord, as we look at these individuals tonight, we pray that you'd challenge our hearts. May the Spirit of God search us. May we answer, are we willing to do these things? And Lord, if we're not willing or we have not been willing, I pray that, Lord, our heart might change, that we might be willing to do whatever it is that you would have us to do, that the gospel can go forth in greater and better 
in bigger ways than it has before. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we're going to look at 10 names here, and we'll kind of go over them very briefly. We won't spend a lot of time. A lot of time and information is not given to us on these different names, but they are important to us. As I've said on a number of occasions, I, I believe every word was given to us for a reason. And so no words were just arbitrarily thrown in there. No names are just arbitrarily thrown in there. There's a reason. There's a purpose for all of these people. And so we want to take some time to try to learn some things for why these people are included here. But the first one, as we talk about Are You Willing?, is from Tychicus here, and from him we want to ask the question, are you willing to serve? Notice verse 7. It says, All my state shall Tychicus declare unto you, who is a beloved brother and a faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord. He says, Whom I have sent unto you for the same purpose, that he might know your estate and comfort your hearts. But notice how he chooses to describe this individual. First of all, he calls him a beloved brother, and you can kind of sense the, the relationship that Paul has with certain individuals. And one of the things that I like about Paul is he's not afraid to share his heart with people, not afraid to declare his emotions. You know, he's the person that would, would say, hey, I love you, I appreciate you, I'm thankful for you, and we need to be willing to pour out our hearts and let people know what they mean to us. We ought to be, be willing to display our affection and, and thoughts of gratitude and all those things. But it's these last couple of phrases that I want to really focus in on as we ask the question, are you willing to serve? He calls him a faithful minister, first of all. And uh, that word minister is the idea of a servant. He's a faithful servant, faithful minister, and it says fellow servant in the Lord. And another thing that I... I like about the Apostle Paul is even though he, we kind of hold him up to this, this status and this level, it's not ever a level that he declared for himself. He always humbled himself. He was always very meek, you know, and uh, brought himself, you know, chiefest of sinners and all those things, you know, least of the apostles he called himself. And, you know, he, he, he didn't establish himself to be up here and everybody else is down here. And, and here we have this individual that's named just a few times in Scripture, and yet the Apostle Paul says he's my fellow servant in the Lord. We're, all, we're, just work, we're working together. We're serving together. And one of the things that we see and learn from the few instances that we see Tychus' name in the Scriptures, he, he's willing just to do whatever it takes. Willing to do whatever it takes, willing to go wherever he needs to go. I mean, whatever Paul wants from him and whatever he needs to done, he's willing to do. Uh, in Ephesians 6, verse number 21, it says, But the Eve also may know my affairs and how I do. Tychicus, a beloved brother and faithful minister of the Lord, shall make known to you all things. And in, in another verse, Paul talks about sending Tychicus to Ephesus, as he mentions in chapter 20, or verse 21 here. In Titus 3.12, Paul writes, When I shall send Artemis unto thee, or Tychicus, and I believe Tychicus, Tychicus is the one that he sent and not Artemis, says, be diligent to come unto me to Nicopolis, for I have determined there to winter. But where, wherever Paul needed him to go, he's willing to go. Whatever needs to happen. And man, I'm so thankful for the people that, that God brings together that are just willing to do whatever. You know, a couple weeks ago, I just I mentioned the fact that the person who used to take care of our lawn moved away, and so they don't go here anymore. And uh, just uh, the next day, I think it was, maybe we had somebody out there uh, mowing the lawns, have done it for the last two weeks. Just whatever, whatever needs to be done. We have people that you know just come in on their own and they clean and they do whatever they can and help out wherever, however. Doesn't matter if they're recognized or not. They don't really care about that. They just see a need, hear about a need. Let's do it. And man, I'm thankful for people like that. And we have a lot of people like that. And really, the question we need to all need to answer is: Are you willing to serve? You know, whatever it is, whatever it takes to get the job done, whatever we can do so that more people can hear the gospel of Christ, am I willing to do it? Am I willing to go here? Am I willing to be involved and to serve whatever it means? And so uh, Tychicus, he's willing to serve. He's willing to get involved, whatever it takes. Not too good for any task, not above anything. I want to get down. I'm just a servant 
of the Lord. Then we see in Nesimus in verse number 9, and ask the question, are you willing to make it right? Onesimus is willing to make it right. Notice verse number 9 says, With Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother, who is one of you, they shall make known unto you all things which are done here. So he names Onesimus with Tychicus here. And uh, for, for some of you, you remember that name from the book of Philemon. And uh, here he is, he's a runaway slave. He was not fond of Philemon and everything else. And so he, he runs away to Rome. While he's in Rome, he runs into the Apostle Paul. Here's the gospel of Jesus Christ and is gloriously born again. And so what does he do? He, he goes back to Philemon. Makes his way back. And uh, in, in Philemon chapter 1, verse number 10, the Apostle Paul writes, I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds. And talks about how that he, 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 has, he has strong feelings for this guy. You know, just a runaway slave. Yet he comes to Christ and he's a son in the faith. And one of the things as you continue to read on down through the book of Philemon is he says, receive him like you'd receive me. You know, here, here are your runaway slaves coming back. And Paul says, receive him like you'd receive me. And one of the things he says is, I would have preferred to keep him here with me. That's how important that this individual was, the Apostle Paul. Man, I, I would love to have him here with us. And we all have people like that. Man, I would I'd love to keep, if I could just surround myself with a bunch of people like this. And then there's other people you're like, ah, I could probably do, do without that kind of person. And, but he wasn't that way. He said, man, I would love to keep him here with me. But, you know, there were some things that needed to be taken care of. And so he sent him back. And, in, and one of the things he says is he was a servant. He's now his brother. He ran away a servant, a slave. He's coming back a brother in the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul calls him here, beloved brother, who is one of you. How fascinating that that is. But when you look at his story and his life, he's willing to go back. Willing to make it right. And I, I wonder, are there some things in our lives that we need to go back and make right? Are there some people that we've hurt that we have to go back and apologize for? There's things, some things that we've done that we need to go back and we need to make some restitution. If we're going to be the servant of God that we need to be and God wants us to be, we need to be willing to go back and make it right. I think of Zacchaeus who was a cheater and, and steal and all this kind of stuff. And man, he came to know Jesus Christ as his Savior and he, he's going to make it right. He's going to pay back plus interest. We need to be willing to make it right. Verse number 10 talks about Aristarchus. And uh, he asked the question, are you willing to suffer? Willing to suffer. It says Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner saluteth you. And... Uh, in Acts chapter number 19, turn over there, Acts chapter number 19, we, lead, we read a little bit more about this Aristarchus, whom the Apostle Paul calls him fellow prisoner, and these were not the cushy, you know, executive prisons that some people in our country go to today. These are harsh circumstances. But look at Acts 19, beginning in verse number 23. The Bible says, In the same time there arose no small stir about that way, for a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, which made silver shrines for Diana, brought no small gain unto the craftsmen, whom he called together with a workman of like occupation, and said, Sirs, ye know that by this craft we have our wealth. Moreover, ye see and hear that not alone at Ephesus, but almost throughout all Asia, this Paul hath persuaded and turned away much people, saying that they be no gods which are made with hands. So that not only this our craft is in danger to be set at naught, but also that the temple of the great goddess Diana should be despised, and her magnificence should be destroyed, whom all Asia and the world worshipeth. When they heard these sayings, they were full of wrath and cried out, saying, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. 
The whole city was filled with confusion, and having, grit, and having caught Gaius and Aristarchus, men of Macedonia, Paul's companions in travel, they rushed with one accord into the theater. And so here, because of the change that was in people's hearts and lives, came to know Jesus Christ as their Savior, they turned their back on idolatry, and man, you, people, the world doesn't really care what we do until it starts to affect them financially. You start to affect them financially, you start to affect their power, their influence, and whatever else, then they start paying attention. And you're, you're, you're hitting us in the wallet. We don't like that. And so they're after Paul, they're after anybody that's with him, and Aristarchus is one of those that they grabbed and they beat, and he was put in prison, but willing to suffer. And the more that time goes on here in this country, the more we're going to have to be willing to suffer for the cause of Christ. Most of the world for most of time has had to suffer great persecution to declare, I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. We have been very fortunate in this country. Uh, almost to the point where it has done the Christian faith a detriment in this country. Um, you look throughout the New Testament, throughout the world, anywhere where persecution on the Christian church is taking place, the gospel goes forth in great power. Why? Because people are genuine. They're willing to sacrifice. Take my life. I don't care. I'm going to speak the truth. That's the way that they live their lives. That's what they were willing to do. Paul and others were willing to be beaten, stoned, in prison. Aristarchus willing to suffer for the sake of the gospel and Man, the question he proposes to me and proposes to each of us is, are you willing to suffer? And what are you willing to suffer? We looked at that series, Are You a Christian? And asked, you know, it says you need to be willing to take up your cross daily. You know, what are we willing to suffer? Most of us aren't willing to suffer very much for the gospel of Jesus Christ. We don't want to suffer embarrassment, so we don't tell anybody about Jesus. We don't, we're, we don't want to suffer an inconvenience, and so we're not willing to go out of our way to tell somebody. Aristarchus wasn't like that. Throw me in prison. I'm willing to suffer. I'm willing to, whatever it takes, whatever the cost. And each of us need to be willing to count the cost. What, am, I, am I willing to pay the price? Because following Jesus is going to cost you something. Are you willing to suffer? And then it talks about Marcus here. And he asks the question, are you willing to try again? Are you willing to try again? It says in verse number 10 there, And Marcus, sister's son to Barnabas, touching whom he received commandments, if he come unto you, receive him. And boy, Marcus here stirs up some different feelings throughout the New Testament. You remember that he went on one of the missionary journeys with the Apostle Paul, and then partway through, he decided, I'm going home. We don't know the reason why. We don't know why he left. It was a serious enough thing that the Apostle Paul, next time he's getting ready to go on a missionary journey, and, and Mark comes up, and Paul's like, what are you doing here? And Barnabas is like, he's coming with us. And Paul said, no, he's not. He's not coming. And man, they're disputing with one another whether Marcus was going to come or not. Paul said, he's not coming with me. I'm not going. If he's going, I'm not going. I'm going somewhere else. I mean, that's the kind of person. That was, that was the, the seriousness with which Paul looked at him giving up and walking away for whatever the reason. We don't know. Um, it could have been a legitimate thing, health of his mother or whatever else, but the scripture tells us no man looking back is fit. And so... Here, Paul said, nope, ain't happening. Turn over to Acts chapter number 15. Acts chapter number 15. And maybe this is you here tonight. Maybe for whatever reason, and, and goes along with what we talked about this morning, talking about prodigals, maybe for whatever reason you, you gave up and you walked away. And we all have moments of doubt. We all have moments because of circumstances of our life that maybe we get upset, we even get angry at God, we question him and whatever else. So we're not going to get too hard on Marcus because there's been a lot of times where, man, I'm like, Lord, I'm done. I quit. And then, you know, the Lord smites my heart and I, you know, repent of that and uh, move along. God, forgive me. Give me another chance. And, and 
But look at verse 36 of Acts chapter number 15. It says, And some days after, Paul said unto Barnabas, Let us go again and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they do. And Barnabas determined to take with him John, whose surname was Mark. But Paul thought not good to take him with them, who departed from them from Pamphylia, and went not with them to the work. And the contention, verse 39, was so sharp between them, that they departed asunder one from the other. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed into Cyprus, and Paul chose Silas and departed, being recommended by the brethren under the grace of God. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, confirming the churches. And, you know, what a sad thing that here we've got this contention because of Marcus's actions. Now God's even able to take things like that and cause the gospel to go forth as Barnabas the encourager takes Marcus under his wing and they go and they travel and they preach and Paul takes Silas and goes another way. But we also get the idea in 1 Peter 5.13 that Peter discipled Marcus and took him under his wing. And, and he says, The church that is at Babylon elected together with you, saluteth you, and so doth Marcus my son, he calls him. And so there are those that believe that Peter took Mark underneath his wing and helped him. And if anybody knew about coming back from pay failure, it's Peter. If anybody knew what it was like to be able to get a second chance, and I'm thankful that our God gives second and third and fourth and so on chances, that if I repent, I want forgiveness, he's willing to forgive and, and let me start over. Now, that doesn't mean there won't be lasting repercussions because of my actions. But it doesn't mean he's done with me forever. It doesn't mean that I can't serve him. The way that I serve him may be different. But there's always that opportunity to come back and to try again. And so even, even Paul had to recant from this uh, contention. And he says in 2 Timothy 4.11, that last part of the verse, says, Take Mark and bring him with thee. For he is profitable to me for the ministry. And, and what a wonderful thing. That here at this point, Paul was so determined, I don't want nothing to do with Mark. I don't want him with me. That he's willing to break partnership with this great man of God, Barnabas. And now he comes around and he's saying, listen, hey, when you come, can you bring Mark? Because he's profitable to me for the ministry. And man... If you want it, the second chance is out there. But you have to want it. Mark wanted to get up and try again. He's willing to try again. Sometimes that means humbling ourselves and, and repenting and those sorts of things, but he's willing to do so. Verse number 11 talks about justice. And he asked the question, are you willing to comfort? Willing to comfort. It says, in Jesus, which is called justice, who are of the circumcision... These only are my fellow workers under the kingdom of God, which have been a comfort unto me. Now, that word comfort there, this is the only time it's used in your Greek New Testament there. And it's the idea of not just encouragement and comfort by being there, but with the words that you say. And, and you know what? There are times where I meet with people and I, I don't know what to say. You know, a tragedy happens and whatever else. And I, I tell, I'm honest with people. Like, if I don't know what to say, I'll tell them. I don't know what to say. I'm here. I'll pray for you. I'll be with you. You're not alone. But I really don't know what to say in this circumstance. And uh, it's important to have people like that. That can just, sometimes we just need people who are there. Um, but here, it's the idea of he knows exactly what to say just has the words of comfort and encouragement. And of course, the Bible tells us we're not to let corrupt communication proceed out of our mouths, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace to the hearers. And man, we ought to be, as Christians, we ought to be a person that people look forward to seeing. That man, when I see that person, I know they're going to encourage me with what they have to say. I know they're going to encourage me by their presence. We ought to be that for one another. It's one of the things I love about gathering together is being able to see people that I know, they're going to be comforting and encouragement to me. 
outside of these walls, you run into people that are so hostile and so angry to the things of God and want nothing to do with Christianity and all that kind of stuff. And it's nice to see some friendly faces. Man, it's a shame when you walk into church and you can't find a friendly face. When it's, when it's warfare and fighting in the church, that's not the way it should be. And uh, we, we make lives too much about ourselves. You know, some people, you can tell them your feelings and your problems or whatever else, and then they have to go a step further and talk about how terrible their life is. It's almost like some sort of competition. Can't, I mean, can't, yeah, I'm struggling, but can't you just, like, tell me you're praying for me or something like that. I don't need to hear right now about all your problems and this and that. You know, sometimes we just need some encouragement. And let's be that encouragement for those who are with us, willing to comfort. Epaphras asked the question, are you willing to pray? In verse number 12, it says, Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. For I bear him record that he hath a great zeal for you and them that are in Laodicea and them in Hierapolis, willing to pray. And I love how he calls Epaphras here in verse number 12 a servant of Christ. That he is just a slave to the Messiah and whatever God wants him to do, he's going to do. And we've already talked about that, being willing to serve. But uh, remember in Colossians 1.7, in the beginning we, we, we talked about Epaphras a little bit. It says, As ye also learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant who is... For you, a faithful minister of Christ, to believe that he's the pastor of the church here in Colossians, possibly of Laodicea and Hierapolis as well. Um, but serve those people there, love them very deeply. And he's the one who came to Paul and gave a report on the church of Colossae and how they were doing. And here, all the troubles, you know, people don't believe that Jesus is God and he is supreme in all these things. And so Paul sits down and he's, all right, let me, give me a pen, give me a piece of paper, let's, let's write this down. i got something to say. So here as he's taking some time to write out this letter, he's, he's watching the pastor of this church that's come and he's noticing his heart for the people. And when he has a heart for the people, he gets down on his knees and he prays for them. Notice how he describes the prayer for them. He says, laboring fervently for you in prayers. I mean, these weren't just the kind of the weak, pathetic prayers that we sometimes pray. You know, dear Lord, just pray for that person and this person and whatever else. I mean, there's heart involved with how he is praying for these people. There's passion. He's laboring in prayer for these people in this church, man, I'm so thankful for the people who labor in prayer for me and for my family. I know there's people that spend a lot of time praying for me, and they may not be able to serve in a lot of different ways because of age and health and whatever else. Man, some of the most important things that happen is these people get on their knees, so to speak. Some of them aren't even able to do that physically. They get on their knees... And they pour out their heart for the people of God. That the work of God would go forth in great power. And man, I covet the prayers of the people. Why? Because I know that's how things happen. No, that's how things get done. Things go, don't get done because I come up with some great idea and have some speech and whatever else. No, that, that's not what happens. Because that can only hit the ears. The Spirit of God is what reaches the heart. And man, it's the prayers of the people that empower what takes place and he is laboring fervently for you in prayers and notice what he's praying for because his prayers are a lot different than our prayers are sometimes yes it's good to pray for people's health and those sorts of things but that should not be the majority of our focus because that's very limited view it's a very materialistic right here kind of view of what should happen. We need to have a, a more eternal view. So healing people may not be God's plan and his desire. He, he, the prayers in scripture are more focused on the spiritual. And so he prays, first of all, that they would stand perfect. That's the idea of mature. 
stand perfect and complete. And that's the idea of fulfilled in all the will of God. And we've spent some time in the past talking about the will of God that is very clearly laid out in Scripture, what the will of God is. The plan of God is something different. And we tend to sometimes intertwine and, and kind of swip, switch those out sometimes. The will of God for everybody is exactly the same, laid out in Scripture. His plan for individuals is very different. He's praying here that they would take the will of God and be complete and be mature in it. We ought to take the word of God and apply it to our lives. That's how we do the will of God. But he wants them to be mature. We ought to pray for the spiritual growth and maturity of one another. We ought to pray that each of us would be conformed to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ, that we look more like Christ today than we did yesterday. And we ought to spend a majority of our time praying for one another, not just for physical things, but for spiritual strength and maturity, and that the Word of God would be fleshed out in our lives because that's how this world is going to be reached. Uh, he then prays for Luke, or brings up Luke here and writes about Luke. Luke brings up the question of are you willing to sacrifice? Willing to sacrifice. He says, Luke, the beloved physician, he's the physician here. Now think about Luke. You know, he, he could have made money. Could have been somebody. I'm sure he didn't start off his, his training, education, however it was that he became a physician at that point, thinking he's going to follow some uh, apostle around who can't even make ends meet sometimes and minister to him and serve him and help him and all the physical ailments and problems that he has as he tries to reach the world with the gospel of Christ. He probably didn't start off that way thinking that's what he's going to do. Most likely he had dreams of prominence and money and prestige and all that sort of thing, but he comes to know Jesus Christ as his Savior and he latches on to the Apostle Paul and you know he writes more than a quarter of the New Testament. He's the writer of Luke and the book of Acts. He's willing to sacrifice. Yeah, I could have had more money, but this is what God wants me to do. Could have had this position, this title, or whatever else, but I'm willing to sacrifice that if that's what the Lord wants me to do. And, uh, you know, asks us the question, are you willing to sacrifice? Are you willing to give up, to do without, so that the gospel of Christ can go forth? What are you willing to sacrifice? What's the limit? As Jesus said, if you're not willing to give up all that you have, you cannot be my disciple. A disciple of Jesus is willing to sacrifice, and Luke is willing to make those sacrifices. And then we get to really one of the only dings on the list here. Demas. Demas asks us the question, are you willing to to finish. I read down through these names and I wonder if at this point the Apostle Paul can already sense something's happening in the heart and mind of Demas. Because he's listing all these different names, calling them different things, and here's what they mean to me and what they're doing. Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas. It's like he just kind of kind of throws his name in there. And Demas. And uh, I think about Philemon chapter number 1, verse number 24, where he lists Demas with Marcus, Aristarchus, and Luke, and he calls him my fellow laborers in the book of Philemon. We get down to 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse number 10, and this is not new information for a lot of you. But he says, and he's writing to Timothy here towards the end of his life, he says, For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica. And to what a shame that is. For whatever reason, he walked away. And unlike Mark, we don't read about him coming back. We don't read about him wanting to start over and try again. The last thing we hear about Demas, he's, he's forsaken me. He's walked away. 
He's left. He loves the present world more than he loves eternity. He loves the here and now more than he cares about the kingdom of God. Man, I, I, I think about the people that I know. The people that I've, I, I've known in my life who started out doing something for God, we're excited, we're telling people, we're serving, and now they're nowhere to be found. Nowhere to be found. What a shame that is. Man, I pray that God would get their attention. I pray that he would cause them to turn around and come back. But what a shame it is. And I don't want to be one of those people that used to do something. I don't want to be one of those guys like many of my classmates who used to preach, who used to pastor, who used to do this or that. I don't want to be that. Now, if God calls me to do something else, then I'll do whatever it is God calls me to do. But just to walk away because... I'm discouraged, or I just feel like quitting, or whatever else. Man, I don't want that. You shouldn't want that. Man, when I hear the name of Demas, it asks me the question, are, are, are you willing to finish? Are you willing to do what it takes to persevere, to be able to say with the Apostle Paul, I've finished my course, I've kept the faith. And then, we read about Nymphus. Nymphus. In verse number 15, and he asks the question, are you willing to use what you have? He says, salute the brethren which are in Laodicea and Nymphus, notice this, and the church which is in his house. Are you willing to use what you have? You know, how do you view your car, your house, your time, your money? We need to recognize everything that we have has been given to us by God. We're just stewards of it. It belongs to him. And so if God wants me to use my house to reach people with the gospel of Christ and help people be discipled, then, then use it. If it gets broken down and tore up, whatever. God, it belongs to you. you no, know, use my car to, to bring people in. And man, we're so grateful for the people that have helped us get the, purchase the van that we have now. And we, we look at it as if God, it's a God's vehicle. So if we, he wants us to pick people up or take them here and there and whatever else, we're willing to do that. Why? Because it belongs to God. You know, willing to, it may not be much, but God, it's yours, and I'm willing to use it for your honor and for your glory to reach people with the gospel of Christ. He says in verse number 16, And when this epistle is read among you, cause that it be read also in the church of the Lady of Sins, and likewise he read the epistle from Laodicea. And I like what he says about the Word of God here, and I just wrote down, read it and share it. And how important it is for us to be in the Word, reading it, reading it, reading it, sharing it, give it out to others. Verse 17, he talks about the last person that we're going to look at here, Archippus. He asks the question, are you willing to fill your spot? Verse 17, say to Archippus, take heed to the ministry which thou hast received in the Lord, that thou full Fill it. And he asked, he asked the question, are you willing to fill your spot? And we talked about this last year. And we talked about rise up and build. And we looked at Nehemiah and how that we have the great wall and everybody's in their spot building on the wall surrounding Jerusalem. And that we all have our spot. You know, here in the church, here in this community, God's placed us in certain places on the wall. He's made us each different members of the body of Christ, hands and feet and mouths and ears and eyes and nose and all that stuff. We all have our place. Are you fulfilling your spot in the wall? I think of Francis who came up to me this morning after service, says, Pastor, I want to be more involved in the church. What can I do? I said, well, what has God made you to do? You know, you, you think about what God has made you to do. You, you let me know. We'll see how we can fit that into what we're doing here at the church. And so, are you fulfilling your spot? Are you fulfilling? It's not just come and sit. It's, you're, you're here for a reason. You're here to encourage and edify the body of Christ so that we can reach this community the way that God wants us to. And here he asked the question, are you willing to fill your spot? If you're not doing anything for the cause of Christ here, you're not doing your thing. You're not fulfilling your spot. And you need to have the thing here where he says take heed to the ministry you've been given in the Lord that you fulfill it and he closes out by saying the salutation by the hand of me Paul and, and oftentimes what they would do is Paul would dictate and someone else would write it 
and then he would take a pen and he would kind of close out the letter, which is what he does here by his own hand. And he says, first of all, remember my bonds. Man, the suffering the Apostle Paul went through for the gospel of Christ. He often said, please pray for me. It was horrible circumstances many times. He suffered physically because of it. And he closes out with this, grace be with you. Grace. Remember, that's the good things that you and I do not deserve. God pouring out his blessings that we don't deserve. And if anybody understood what grace was all about, it's the Apostle Paul, because he spent most of his life trying to earn his way to heaven, trying to earn God's favor and his blessings. And finally he said in Philippians, I had to count all that but dung. And all I need is Christ. So he understood this word grace. It's not just something that he kind of throws in there because that's how he closes out his letter. It's because he's so thankful for the grace that God had bestowed upon him and he wanted God's grace poured out on the lives of these believers as well. And so, looking at these names here, these ten individuals, are you willing? 